In February, these stepping stones clung on for dear life under a foot of churning water. Southern streams arose for the hour, and the white lamp hub perched itself uneasily above the swollen brook. Lambs buffeted blindly inside their dams. Driven off the moorside, our feet were grounded on tarmac beneath the busy waves. Now, an afternoon on the cusp of summer, gentleness has arrived. The same lambs headbutt the air for kicks, flicking neat ankles into the air. The glistening road is silent, but the walls mutter, We have been here, we have seen it all so many times, the silly sheep, the sentimental urbanite. Turned Walker for a day. <laughs> so, um, what else do I write about? Um, another bit of my MA I wrote um, in response to a fantastic poem by Alice Oswald called Memorial, which is her excavation of the Iliad. Um, and this was my immediate response to hearing it first. I've been absolutely fascinated by the way we've been weaving. Um, words and, and music and other sort of media to, to convey words and um, I think drawing on different traditions is really important and she's actually done a really beautiful recording of this and I heard her speak this long poem before I actually read it and this is my immediate response to it. It's called Undone. In midlife a spider crawls over a woman's body laying down webs between her breasts clouding with fine filaments the corners of her eyes. The sharp edge of her cheek becomes blunted. The smooth paleness of her hands rots into mottling. In the ninth year of the war, a soldier lifts his head to peer through blooded eye holes of a helmet, glimpsing a woman not uncomely and well-bred. But, truth be told, in the dark reaches of the night, it is not her fall which stiffened his prick, but the thought of his serving wench bending smooth haunches over pots of oil in the shady corner of the storeroom. And as he hears the whistling progress of the spear that will pin him to the ground, he wonders whether it was the face of Helen that had driven them on, all the fathers bereft, the wives desolated, sons unfathered by carnage, or rather the act of possession, that ancient hunger that drives men to war without regret or indecision until, at the final gasp, the hand each soldier craves is not that of his fine wife or willing whore, but the uncunning clasp of the woman who gave him suck, whose face has been veiled by the spinnings of time. <laughs> Change of mood. Um, I've been saying to, to people I've been chatting to tonight that um, my relationship with, with um, people is difficult enough, but my relationship with the Almighty is even more vexed. Um, and um, I'm not sure if he or she um, really understands me at all. Um, and th this is another one that I wrote. I wrote about a year ago, and um, I hope it makes sense. It's called Buzz Off. For some days now, bees have shared the air brick in my study. Tomorrow, a field biologist arrives to identify, pacify, and remove them from my life. I envisage him calming them to sleep with puffs of smoke, then carefully taking a soft brush and sweeping the dozing creatures into a large canvas sheet, like the one the Apostle Peter saw in a vision lowered from heaven containing an ark full of all God's four-footed beasts. I wonder if, while he is about it, the biologist, or maybe some cosmic exterminator, could brush my room clean of God, collecting each vituperative doctrine, the sting of original sin and the foul stench of misogyny, and drop them into the hanging cloth, where necessary by tiny demons who stole their pitchforks from Hieronymus Bosch. But in the evening, having cleaned the smears of honey off the wall, I find the Almighty curled on my sofa between the cats, like the old friend who forgets to leave after dinner, 
sending me yawning into the kitchen for a second pot of coffee, wishing I could extinguish the candle and pad upstairs, accompanied by purring companions and no sense of guilt. Um, how many more? A couple more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what I guess you want. Um, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you might regret that. <laughs> um, Okay, um, I'm going to read a couple now about um, older people and about um, what happens when you're ageing. Um, and first I'm going to read one which I, I may have, I mean, I'm improvising a little bit here, I may have read this last time. Um, and it's about a situation that's very common for women of my age, which I think of it as being a sandwich situation between the Still a few demands with children, dependent children, and the increasing demands of parents. It's called discalced, and I should explain that discalced um, is it's a sort of religious illusion, and discalced Carmelites were, were um, monks and, and nuns who went barefoot, and you might have, you might sort of know that, that nuns and monks sometimes <coughs> just wear sandals, and it's sort of part of the sort of religious tradition to do this. So that's what the title means, and I, in, in the volume I have actually put some explanatory notes of that because there are lots of strange allusions, so discussed. He's fine, your carer says. He's lost a shoe, but happy going barefoot. I thank her and return to my meeting, distracted by the thought of you steadying one foot at a time on the 15 treads of the stairs, your toes leaning into the deep pile as you go up, then down, because you don't remember why up, or even what up is. And I try to take an interest in a, a smart spreadsheet, pleased to think you'll be wearing socks in a nice shade of fawn, the colour of post-war frugality. And as she made these for you, fingers flashing the four silver spears which clacked and chattered as she turned the heel, knitting her love into each pair. Something you can run your fingers over, because now that words are treacherous, textures console. And I plan to make for your birthday a patchwork cushion from scraps of warm Welsh wool edged with blanket stitch, and I'll show your hands its narrative of elusive shades from a forgotten land. Suddenly this seems so much more urgent than commenting on the coded cells which populate the page. A necessary ministry, a laying on of hands. I'm going to finish with two, um, also about ageing. Um, and these are two women um, I knew in very different contexts. Um, the first one was one of my students. I'm just going to get a stuff of water. Um, I have the great privilege of, of doing some work at the Open University, which is just the most fun thing to do, really, because you work with an amazing diversity of students who are uh, very talented, have got enormously wide life experience, and they're incredibly hardworking, committed, which I have to say is not true of my 19 year olds. <laughs> and this particular student actually had quite a lot of difficulty, and I had to give her some extra time and support. So I went round to her house a couple of times to help her with, with her essays and things. Um, and she invited me to a birthday party. And um, this is what I wrote um, recently when I walked past her house. Chrissy. On your 70th birthday, you jived groin to groin with your man, your smile as radiant as your shoes, wick as a flame in your white suit, dodging the potted herbs and parked cars in the lane beyond the yard. The sun shone. At my 50th, my invitation went unanswered. Your phone rang and rang. Time passed for us both. Today, passing the place where the dancing and music had spilled from the house like a glass overflowing, I glanced through the window. Where were your books? And surely those florid curtains can't be yours. I hope you're still dancing, Chrissy. one small, pale hand clasping the firm, ebony fingers of your lover. Or that the candle was snuffed out, not that your flame is guttering in an airless, sterile room, 
with you shrouded in, tr in crimping and Velcro slip-ons instead of dancing shoes. Um, this was a woman I met last year uh, at a conference, and um, when I went to the conference this year, they, they said um, uh, that this person had, had died just a couple of weeks before, so I was very, very glad I'd had the chance to, um, to meet her and be inspired by her. It's called Patricia. When you're a 92-year-old Byzantinist, the conference comes to you one snowy evening after the talking, as a glass of red transferred carefully into trembling, eager fingers, and a napkin full of pretzels, which you peck at between anecdotes, blowing crumbs at me as I bend my ear to your tail. Sixty years of conference wool on your back, you're no longer upright, but your gaze is straight as an arrow, and your eyes bright, now with fun, as we agree that being naughty is wasted on the young, now with tears for your long-gone husband. An attendant daughter suggests I might want to circulate, but I'm hooked, swapping stories about Brussels, mine circa 1973, yours post-war, and the joy of bearing children, and then it's time to go, and I press a kiss onto the soft crenulations of your cheek. Your story warms me as I pick a route back over the crusted ice of a recalcitrant spring. I've got one or two copies for sale if you're interested. Thank you.